So for those of you who like to remain on top of the church's calendar, today is the last day in the season we call Easter. Next week will be Pentecost Sunday, we'll have baptisms, the colors will change to red, so be sure and wear red next Sunday. Now almost every year during this Easter season, someone lets me in on a secret that bothers them enough that they really want to talk about it. Pastor Helen, they confess, I love coming to church on Easter, singing all those great hymns, singing a packed sanctuary and all that, but I just can't make sense of the resurrection part of the story and, and all that stuff about Jesus hanging out with people after he had died and been buried. Now, if you're someone who has said or thought this same thing, trust me, you are not alone. We know from all four Gospels that from the very beginning, Jesus' resurrection was met with disbelief and skepticism and doubt. And we know from Paul's writings to the church in Corinth that those earliest Christians also struggled with the meaning of resurrection, not just Jesus' resurrection, but with what it means for those who have died. So part of the reason that the Corinthians had such a hard time understanding resurrection was, and besides the fact that it is difficult to understand, was that they had grown up in a very sophisticated culture and had been exposed to a number of very well-established and well-respected belief systems that espouse different understandings of life after death. And over time, some of these aspects of these other belief systems had, had found their way into that congregation and had begun eating at the core of that early Christian faith. And it was causing some of the folks to, to, in that church to do and say and believe things that just don't jive with what it means to have life in Christ. And so Paul sees what's happening and he does his best, his best to pull them back to the basics of the Christian faith. And, and we can see in verses 3 and 4 that, that he points to the foundational event of faith. He doesn't point to Jesus' birth or his life or his teachings or his miracles or his ministries. No, the, for, for Paul, the foundational at the core of our faith is Christ's death, Christ's burial, Christ's resurrection. That is what it means to have faith. And the rest of chapter 15, he spends doing his best to back up what he's saying is at the core of our faith. Now, as valiant as his efforts are and were, many people in that church and many people today still struggle with the meaning of resurrection, with what it means to die and be raised to new life. And it's very common to wonder about such a thing. Now, as I've wondered about it a lot over the years, I have found that I can better get my head wrapped around what resurrection is if I can name what it isn't. And so, with the help of Bible scholars Fred Craddock and Eugene Boring, who, by the way, wrote a, a really, really fine commentary that one of our Sunday school classes, the Emmaus class, uses every week for their foundational Bible study, with their help, let's consider what resurrection is not. Okay. First, resurrection is not resuscitation. It's not the restoration of the dead person back to life in this world. The Bible has a number of stories about people being resuscitated, and there are many stories today of people who are declared clinically dead and, and then are resuscitated. But resuscitation is temporary. The one who was resuscitated will still die. Jesus wasn't resuscitated. He did not come back to his same life in, in this world. He was raised to a, a new life, a new order of being beyond this life. Resurrection is not resuscitation. 
Second, resurrection, re resurrection is not reincarnation. Now, many long-established faith traditions have within them a belief in reincarnation, and there are multiple ways to understand this very complex understanding of what a reincarnation is, except that it is not resurrection. In its most simplistic form, reincarnation is a theory that after we die, we come back to Earth in a different form. And if you've done well on this life, perhaps you move up to a higher, better, even more virtuous form of life. And, but if you mess up, you could be reborn into a less desirable life, perhaps one of struggle and poverty or even a, a lower life form. And you keep dying and coming back as another living being, hopefully in a, in a higher form until you reach the highest form, which is all but impossible to reach. And at this level, reincarnation is really just another version of what we call works righteousness. You know, where you get rewarded for doing well, and you get punished for doing poorly, and you have eternity to try to do better in this world and get it right next time around. But that's not what resurrection faith says about life and death. An Easter faith says that life isn't about working hard until we get it right. It's about being embraced by the grace of God. Or as we like to say around here, God loves you and there is nothing you can do about it. And so Paul, Paul whose life was far from virtuous, says it very well in verse 10 when he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and whatever may await me, whatever may await us beyond this life has nothing to do with what we've done through our good works and has everything to do with what God has done to save God's people, to give us life. Resurrection is not reincarnation. Third, Resurrection is not about immortality. It's not about the soul living on forever, hopefully in heaven, after the body dies. This belief in the immortality of the soul, as they call it, was very, very common in Paul's day, and it continues to be a very popular belief today. But resurrection is not about the soul being immortal and leaving the body after it dies. Because you see, belief in the immortality of the soul says something about human nature. It says that there is something within human beings that can't die ever. But resurrection, because it acknowledges the reality of death, says something about God. It says that God acts for those who are dead. God acts for those who cannot act for themselves. In other words, a belief in the immortality of the soul as it, uh, as it tries to soften or even deny the reality of death suggests that in the end it's really all about me because that immortal part of me is so important and, and so special that of course I'm going to live forever. But resurrection reminds us and says it's not about me or about who I am or what I do. It's about God and who God is and what God does. And God raises the dead to life. Now, Fred Craddock and Jean Boring put it very bluntly when they say this, human beings are not immortal and do not have immortal souls. They die. We die. 
body, mind, soul, and we are totally powerless unless God acts to grant life beyond death. And that's exactly what God does. Resurrection, you see, is about placing all of our trust in the God who raises the dead to new life. Now, fourth, and related to this, resurrection is not about splitting the body and the soul into two separate entities, with the soul being so much more valuable than the body that it has to escape it at death. Rather, resurrection says that the body and soul are are one unit, inseparable, invaluable beyond measure, cherished by God. In other words, The soul matters to God, but so does the body. All bodies matter to God. Heavenly bodies, sun and moon, matter. Earthly bodies, sea and mountains and plains, matter. All living bodies matter. As someone once said, matter matters to God. That's why God created the material realm and called it good. That's why God created us as living, breathing humans with body, mind, heart, and soul. That's why God came to us in a body and said to us, you matter. Every part of your matter matters. Yes, the resurrection affirms the goodness and value of bodies. But it isn't about dead and decaying bodies coming out of the ground or or cremated ashes morphing together like you might see in the movies. Paul says this when he says, the bodies we now have are weak and they die. But he goes on to say our bodies will be changed, resurrected into bodies that are eternal. Now he doesn't spell out how this will happen or when this will happen or why this will happen or what the eternal bodies will look like. He's already been very bold in even addressing this question, and he knows enough not to speculate further on this mystery because he knows that it's something that none of us on this side of life can possibly know anything about. And you know, I'm okay with just leaving it at that. That's okay. We don't have to know the details. And finally, Resurrection is not a one-time, isolated event that happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago and will never happen again. Rather, because it happened to Jesus, it opens us up to seeing a whole new reality, a reality that says nothing is impossible for God. And since nothing is impossible for God, since God can and did raise Jesus to new life, God can and does and will raise up and redeem and restore and make new every life that is broken, every life that is bruised, abused, scarred, dead. You see, God has the power to make new every life, including yours. Because, again, that's who God is. That's what God does. That's what God did. That's what God will do. That's the promise of resurrection, and it can be trusted, but not just because I said so, because it's been, uh, not, not because I said so, but because it's been passed down in Scripture 
It's been witnessed to by women. It's been, it's been preached by the apostles. It's been experienced by Paul. It's been revealed to the masses. And Christians throughout the ages have, and today have literally staked their lives on its truth that God acts to make all things new. So resurrection is not about resuscitation or reincarnation. It's not about immortality of the soul or or devalued bodies or a one-and-done event. And because we have ruled out all these things, we can also say what we don't believe in. I can say, for example, this. I don't believe that there is anything I can do to earn my way up to and into the next life. I'm powerless to do that. I don't believe that my body is worthless. I don't believe that suffering should be accepted as a punishment for something I did. I don't believe that my soul is immortal. I don't believe that death, even though it is real, has the final grip on this world. And I don't believe that God is powerless to address what is wrong in this world and broken in my life. And when I, when we can rule out all these things, we can rule in resurrection. We can affirm that God has acted and will continue to act to bring about the day when all will be made new. A day when injustice and poverty and disease and pain and suffering and death will be no more. We can rule in what began when those first believers gathered around the table with Christ. And we can look forward to that time when all will joyously gather around the table with saints throughout the ages. And what a great festival of friends that will be. We can rule all this in because we, like the Apostle Paul and Christians throughout the ages, stake our lives on the one who ultimately rules in love. The one who knows sorrow and injustice and wouldn't wish it on anyone, not even his greatest enemy. The one whose life and death and burial and resurrection tells us that with God, all things are possible. For God can and did and does and will bring heaven and earth together as one and make all things new. This is what I place my trust in and helps me live today. Amen.